We might be too young to have a spotted cow, but we are both diehard Packers fans. I could talk about this for hours. He was my legend. He was my quarterback one. Taysom Hill, forever in my heart. We have a kind of a reputation of being the young, the young diehard fans. How is that, Dr. Pepper Taysom? Amazing. Okay, good. Let's keep it under 25 minutes, all right? Hello there, folks. This is Joey at the Underage Packers Podcast, and I just wanted to hop on here really quick before we kick off this episode and let you know that this whole entire thing was filmed before the Aaron Rodgers trade went through on Monday afternoon. So keep that in mind when we mention that the Packers will be picking at 15, that that is out of date. And also, if we say something along the lines that they only have one second round pick, or if we mention that we're still waiting on the trade to go through, that is all obviously now out the window. But the information in this episode is still great. We had Jacob Westendorf on, who just knows a ton about the draft. He's a great guy. Um, So I hope you still enjoy this episode, despite it being before the big news on Monday. Thanks for watching. All right, we are now joined by Father, contributor on Game on Wisconsin, and uh, Packer Report. Father to, you know, two kids, but also the self-proclaimed father to Rashawn Gary, Jacob Westendorf. Jacob, thank you for joining us today. I can't believe that that still has as much uh, traction as it does. But Yeah, I don't know if Rashawn knows that, but um, <laughs> what's up, Rashawn, if you're watching? Uh, big fan, always have been. Um all that good stuff, but it's good to be back, guys. Uh, last time I was here, uh, Big B, I think you had just been diagnosed, so I, I haven't spoken to you personally since yeah. then, so congratulations, first and foremost, on winning a bigger battle than any of us could ever imagine, so kudos to you, man. That was uh, that was awesome. That's been the highlight, well, one of the highlights of my 2023. Thank you. Absolutely. So, um, with Jacob today, we're going to be previewing this draft going on in Kansas City this weekend one of the biggest events of the NFL offseason, obviously the biggest one. So uh, first off, you know, before we get too deep into this draft class itself, I just wanted to kind of take a look and on what you guys think on where the Packers are at right now and what this draft will mean to them. Because they've been in a weird state these past two drafts and trying to build this team because they Mm -hmm. have been in a place where they have been what some would consider a different version of being all in on a certain team, but that is very out of character for the Packers to be looking to win now um, and put all their chips on the table. And we've seen kind of the, the point where they're at as a team and their mindset on how they usually operate. We've seen those clash in the past few years. I think Jordan love that selection is good. A good example of that. So Jacob, I'll start with you. How do you think the Packers are going to use this draft to kind of rebuild this team? Yeah, uh, they'll never openly call it a rebuild. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's kind of where maybe there's some disagreement. I don't I don't envision the Packers like if you got truth serum into them saying like, yeah, we can win the Super Bowl in 2020. Like, I just can't. I mean, unless Jordan Love is Patrick Mahomes, but like better. That's the only way I can envision that being a possibility. Like uh, that's just kind of the way that it is. As far as actually building the team, I think you made a good point. And in the last couple of years, they've kind of been in some version of all in. And we've talked about the team as if like, Oh, just fix like after the championship game against the bucks, it was like, ah, just a receiver in a corner. That's it. That's all they needed to win a super bowl. And then after they lost to the 49ers, Oh, they just need a receiver and, and a defensive lineman. Maybe And like, that's just not where this team is. And I don't want to say that's okay, but like, that's just not where this team is. So I I think that, you know, Brian Gutekunst, this is a huge draft for him personally. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you trade away Aaron Rodgers, then that's a big statement. Uh, You're trading him for a player that is the reason that you're trading him. Uh, Aaron Rodgers isn't going to be a Packer because they drafted Jordan Love. Uh, And that's, I mean, that's a whole separate rabbit hole, obviously to go into, but he can't, he can't have a 2018 where there's one good player to show for it. He can't have a 2020 where it's AJ Dillon and maybe Jordan love and John Runyon, which is a nice player. Like he's a solid six round pick. That's awesome. But you know, this is a, this is a big draft, but I think it really starts with 
you know, I mean, we're doing the same stuff that we always do is, ah, it's got to be Jackson Smith and Jigba. And if it's not, then they screwed it up. It's a, well, no, <laughs> um, no, it's uh, really, it is. And I know that this is like as cliche as it gets, but to, in my opinion, who's the best player available at whatever position, uh, maybe that except for quarterback and probably off ball linebacker. Cause if they took an inside linebacker back to back years, that'd be a little wild, but yeah, yeah. other than that, I mean, they could use an offensive tackle. We've, David Bakhtiari, Yosh Nyman may not be here next year. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Uh, they could use a pass rusher or two. They could use a defensive lineman or four. Like they, they really are lacking in that department. They don't have any tight ends on their roster that I would consider good starters. Um, mm-hmm. They have one receiver that I'm confident in as a really good NFL player and a guy that I'm relatively high on with Romeo Dobbs, but we don't know. And I mean, corners, maybe there's one that's here for 2024, like Rasul Douglas might be here. He might not be, who knows? Um, they don't have any safety. <laughs> they don't have any safeties. No. Um, no. You know, the roster is kind of a, it's in a decent spot. You know, they're not the, one of the worst. Yeah. They're not one of the least talented teams in football, but it is a little bit of a met, like the positions that are drained of talent mm-hmm. are really drained. Like it's, yeah. it's rough. So I really do. I think, like it's as cliche and as boring of an answer as I can give you, but to me it is. Who is the best player available, and and what does that do for the team? I, I don't think that you can really. I mean, of course, need factors into that as well, but I don't think you can do what you have in the last couple of years and just say, you know, twenty twenty after after they lost to the Niners the first time, get Brandon Ayuk, get Justin Jefferson, and we're waltzing into the Super Bowl. Like that's just not where this team's going to be. It's can you make your team better? And I think the ceiling for this Packers team as it sits right now, barring some very drastic changes is make the playoffs and maybe win a playoff game, depending on the matchup. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. And like you said, with Brian Gutekinds, this is the pick in 2020 of Jordan Love. And now this draft will define his career and the future of his job with Green Bay uh, and how it turns out. And with where they're at, like you mentioned, Jacob, outside of quarterback and inside linebacker, they need more players at every single position, more depth, more talent um, at pretty much every position. So would not see them just try to gamble on as many guys as possible, just get as many possibilities, roll the dice as many times as they can uh, by maybe trading back a few times and get any prospects that they can because not a lot of – like you said, just not a lot of uh, depth at many positions. Um, no, and so- that's why, like, when somebody asks, who would you trade up for or whatever, I don't know that I can endorse a trade up Yeah. for anyone. Um, I mean, there might be a few exceptions to that rule. Like, if Jalen Carter is sitting at eight, or maybe, maybe it's not a great example, but, like, 11, and it won't cost that much to go up and get, then sure. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, again <clears> – <throat> Trade-ups, in my opinion, are for teams that are are closer or trying yes. to find the next quarterback. So if the Packers were trying to trade up, then I would say, yeah, trade up for C.J. Stroud or whoever that quarterback would be. But they're not going to be doing that because Brian Gutekunst did not lay the chips on the table, so to speak, to never let – like they're not trading Aaron Rodgers to let someone other than Jordan Love be yeah. the quarterback. I think that would be – I mean, I didn't think they would take Jordan Love either, though. So I guess, I guess what do I know? Yeah. Certainly. And that's with that, it's like when you ask the question, what is their top needs? It's like, I mean, there's some positions that you can point to safety, tight end, offensive tackle, but it's not like it is in other years where they absolutely, their first round pick has to be one of those positions because, you know, if they trade back, I could see them doing that. But if they say put two, you're seeing what is available and pretty much any player would be able to help them out at any position. Um, so, Big B, I'll ask you, where do you think uh, the Packers are at this at 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 this point, and what do you think they uh, look to do in this draft? Yeah, I mean, you guys pretty much nailed it on, on the head. Like, pretty much take the best player available at the higher end picks that we have, mm-hmm. and um, like kind of like you said, Joey, try to trade back as much as possible. Try to get get as many picks as you can. And then that also equals out to cheap labor to many positions of need Mm -hmm. because we don't have no cap space to go out and get free agents. We might 
get one or two maybe after the draft or yep. maybe even before, but get as many cheap labor guys. And I think that's pretty much the game plan for this draft. Yeah, and obviously the Aaron Rodgers trade will affect their whole game plan with this draft, even no matter if it is pick 13, which we can pray, um, or uh, a second round pick from New York. And um, Jacob, with my next question, I just wanted to ask you with the draft class this year um, and the talent available, how does each position group and their strength, how does that align with the Packers needs this year and kind of where they're at? Yeah, relatively well um, with one very glaring exception. Uh, Mm -hmm. The tight end position is the strongest group in this class, in my opinion, uh, Michael Mayer, Dalton Kincaid, uh, Sam Laporta, Darnell Washington, all of those guys, um, and even Luke Musgrave, honestly, and I'm not as high on him as some others are, but I think all five of them could step in, honestly. And, you know, I know the learning curve is sharper at tight end than it is for some other places, but I think all of those guys could step in and start relatively quickly uh, for Green Bay and provide quite a bit to them uh, right away. So that, that bodes nicely. Um, and the depth of the class is good too. Uh, mm-hmm. So when you start talking about the way Gudikans typically does things is throw, you know, one, two, three, two or three picks at a time at a position that's really uh, devoid. Like last year they needed receivers. They drafted three guys. I think they'll draft at least one or two more this year. Tight end. I, I, I would bet on three uh, to be honest, mm-hmm. like one early, one mid, one late, you know, maybe that means one, four, seven, maybe it means two, four, five, you know, I don't know what it looks like, but I would bet with the way that it's gone, they'll take multiple guys at that position. Uh, the pass rush group is pretty good at the top. You know, the first seven or eight guys I think could be, you know, starting all the way up, obviously with Tyree Wilson or Will Anderson and working your way down to, you know, Felix last name, I can't pronounce for uh, Kansas state or the Northwestern kid who's got a name that I should probably learn how to pronounce, but I haven't yes. yet. You know, you get to that group. I think there's some starters that Green Bay could find on on day two, which is where I, I think they're going to have another second round pick based on the way this Jets trade is is looking to line up. I still think that is going to get done bef- either before the draft or like on draft night. I just don't mm-hmm. see I don't see how it's beneficial for either one of these teams to let it go past the draft. Like the right. Packers don't want the Jets to use all their picks and then have to take Rodgers. And the Jets don't want, because like realistically, if the trade's not done draft night, there's no sense for the Packers to do it before June. And then realistically, maybe no sense in them doing it before September. So like, Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't think that serves either team any purpose, but to get back to the original question, um, the tight end group and the pass rush group is pretty good. The offensive tackle class is a little top heavy, but there's some good players there. And that's a guy like, you know, Paris Johnson, if he's sitting there at 15, number one, the Bears screwed something up if they did that, which I mean, come on. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and but like that's a plug and play starter at right tackle that becomes David Bakhtiari's replacement in 2024 he's really good Broderick Jones is really good um Peter Skaronsky might play tackle might play guard he's really good but it really is kind of a top heavy class at the tackle position the one play or the couple places where it really doesn't line up the big glaring exception I talked to at the top uh it, the safety class stinks yeah. um I don't like Brian Branch is the guy that some people fell in love with early. And I don't, number one, I don't really think he's a safety. He played slot corner at Alabama. He doesn't play a ton of deep safety. I just don't know how much he's done that. Um, and I don't know if he can, quite frankly. Then you add in some of his athletic limitations, some of his size limitations, throw all that together. The day two class is okay. Like Jair Brown's pretty good. Quan Martin from Illinois is okay. Um, but there, it's not like, you know, there's no Earl Thomas, which Earl Thomas is one in a million, but like, right. there's no yeah. guys like that. If the Packers pick a safety in the first round, like I'm legitimately upset. I don't get <laughs> upset when they do or don't pick guys. It's just like, you know, I want them to pick somebody that I think is good. Like, so last right. year people are freaking out that they took Quay Walker. I liked Quay Walker. So I didn't mm-hmm. really like freak out about that. Um, so that's the one. And the other one, the defensive line class is another one that's pretty top heavy. Uh, Brian Brisset. Ozzie Smith, Jervon Dexter, and that's about it as far like some of it is a little bit of projection too. So like Lucas Van Ness could maybe be a guy that kicks inside from Iowa, but he's mostly an edge guy. The mm-hmm. Northwestern kid that I mentioned earlier is another guy like that. Keon White from Georgia Tech could be an edge, could be a defensive tackle, kind of the way you want to use him. But the the beef eating, I mean, the Packers, they're the worst run defense in football cumulatively over the last, what, four years or yeah. something like that. 
it's horrendous. So in order to fix that, I don't think, I mean, I know they lost Lowry and Reed and there were some things to be said about Dean Lowry and all that stuff, but they have three guys on their roster that have played NFL snaps. So like, could they take a defensive tackle at 15? Yes. Even though they did that just last year, like their mm-hmm. defensive tackle group, like the least talented positions on the team as we sit right now are tight end safety and defensive line, in my opinion. Yeah. And that's a, that's a tough spot to be like, I don't know how you make your defense better. If you're going to let a team run for six yards of crack, it doesn't really matter how many good pass rushers you have on your team. If you can't slow them down in the running game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, most of these positions that we're talking about, were hoping for a jump in defensive line too. a jump from a lot of those guys that have been in the room for a long time now, um, or not so long, TJ Slayton, um, Devontae Wyatt, Open for some bigger jumps from them and um, Jonathan Ford. I saw your uh, your hate tweet on him the other day, which was funny. Um, but yeah, um, all those positions and the safeties, like you mentioned, um, not a great class um, this year. And I'm really interested to see what they do in the draft and also post draft. You know, you have Adrian Amos who's still out there, and you have Darnold Savage on his fifth year option, and then Rudy Ford. Outside of that. There's nobody, Emma. So we'll be interesting to see what the Packers do to try to repair that position. And then going back to something you mentioned early on in that answer about the the two or three guys that Gudukins likes to take out of position, just uh, get as many guys in the, the room as you can. So my favorite one of those series of three picks is in 2017 when they were really needed running backs. Because at that point, they needed running backs for a long time. But I remember in the 2016 playoffs, they were running out there with Christine Michael and who knows what at running back. Um, but in 2017, they take – they're all day three picks, and you got Devontae Mays, Aaron Jones, and Jamal Williams. And Jones was the uh, – there we go. Jones was the last out of those three picks, I believe. Jamal, Aaron, both very successful for the Packers. And then Devontae Mays just – has to have one of the most prolific careers in NFL history. I think he had like three snaps in the NFL and two of them were more fumbles. So yeah. Devontae Mays, a uh, great example of that. But another one of those uh, series of three that worked out was the offensive lineman um, from 2020 with John Runyon. Um, and then he had two who didn't really work out with Simon Stepaniak from uh, Indiana, I want to mm-hmm. say. And then uh, Jake Hansen from Oregon. And you get one – that turns out out of that three and you know, that is what it is. And hopefully the one we had last year with uh, Watson Dobbs looks like those two are going to turn out to be good. And I like smart Torre a lot too. So with this year, it's going to work out great with the tight ends. They will have their options on day one with uh, some of those top prospects without Dalton Kincaid, Darnell Washington. Um, and then also in the mid rounds too, maybe Sam Laporta, uh, falls a little bit farther to them in the third round, and we'll have plenty of options on day three, too. So hopefully they're able to get their hands on a few good tight ends because even with Josiah DeGuar on the roster, he cannot, you know, he was a good receiver at Cincinnati, too, but he cannot be the main guy you're relying on for your tight end position. So hopefully uh, they're able to uh, sure that position up even just a little bit especially because Aaron Rodgers, um, I mean, one, he never really had a great tight end besides for Michael Finley. Um, you know, he can't count his his only recruit and Jimmy Graham in there. But um, he had your Michael Finley, and outside of that, he didn't have that many other great tight ends. But he also was somewhat reluctant to throw to his tight ends and use them that much in the passing game. And Maybe that was just so strange because how old were you guys when they won the Super Bowl in 2010? Uh, I was five. five? Yeah, five. OK, so you guys may not remember like, oh, nine. Jermichael has that like beast mode playoff game in Arizona. And then the next year, they basically built the entire offense around Finley. And like, I mean, hard play action left, roll right, Finley on a deep crosser type stuff. They were trying to get him involved a lot and really. I don't like to call injuries blessings or anything like that, but the offense got better Mm. when Jermichael got hurt. And then they, they built the offense around Greg Jennings 
uh, who's another popular player amongst uh, Aaron Rodgers fans. So yes. it's kind of interesting how that works out necessarily. But, you know, Greg Jennings becomes the focal point of the offense. And then they kind of just started saying, we're going to spread you out and your third and fourth corners can't cover James Jones and Jordy Nelson or Jennings in the slot. So it's just kind of interesting how, how that all worked out. But Rodgers was all in on his tight ends, especially early in his career. So I don't know when the shift happened, why, you know, anything like that. I mean, he had a nice little, what, month and a half with Jared Cook. And like you mentioned, Joey, I mean, some of it really is just a, a dearth of talent at that. They've been trying to replace Jermichael since his career ended uh, in Green Bay against Cleveland a couple of years ago. And they really had, that was it. That half season of Jared Cook, Jimmy Graham was a bum. Well, that's disrespectful, but Jimmy Graham (laughs) didn't work out. Uh, Mark, the, the guy that they signed after Jared Cook, whose name I won't mention, but he wore number 80 and might be referred to as a unicorn every now and again. He was a legitimate bomb, and I don't care if that's disrespectful. Uh, and then you know, Jay Sternberger, my best friend in the whole world. I don't know if he knows that, but they drafted him. That didn't work out. And DeGuara, like you meant, you know, this isn't an insult when I say this, but like Josiah DeGuara is not a tight end. Like he, you're not going to line him up on the line of scrimmage and do like blocking stuff that way. His prowess as a blocker, which has value, especially in this offense, comes in space. You know, when they bring him in motion as that as that fullback, H-back type stuff. That's the way they got to do this. Uh, so, yeah, with those tight ends, Aaron has was reluctant to throw to them, which was just bizarre. And especially with Matt LaFleur's offense, it was expected that they would kind of get that more involved. Um, so Jordan Love might be a little bit different, especially in his first year, maybe – a little more hesitant to say, take some deeper throws and might use his rely on his tight ends a little bit more. So really need some more bodies in that room, at least, you know, they might even be in need for camp bodies like they were in for wide receivers and OTAs a few years ago when everybody was skipping, they just need people to throw to at the tight end position right now. Um, and, you know, moving on to another one of those positions, offensive tackles, you mentioned, where they kind of might end up in this year draft. And they might be in a bad position at 15, um, might have a run of those top guys ahead of them. But uh, what do you think we'll do there, Jacob, as far as, you know, if they can't land one in round one, uh, what do you think their mindset is going to be at that position? Yeah, that, that's a tough one. It's, you know, the question then kind of becomes, you know, who is the left tackle in 2024? Is he on the roster? Yep. Maybe he is. I don't know. You know, it's possible that they're going to extend Yosh Nyman. Maybe they think Zach Tom is their starting left tackle. Maybe they want to extend David Bakhtiari. I, it's possible. I don't think that's likely, but it's possible. Um, you know, if they can't land one of those top guys early, then it kind of becomes maybe they do what they've done. I think each of the last three years, they've drafted three offensive linemen on day three of the draft. But there isn't – I mean, they've, they've got guys on their roster. How many of them are – quality you know I, I don't know uh, and that's where like if they can't grab one early you know maybe that if it's Paris Johnson Broderick Jones Peter Skaronsky if they like that uh, Darnell mm-hmm. Wright those are kind of the top four uh, guys at that position the one guy I could think of maybe on day two is like Jalen Duncan and maybe he's a guy that they want to grab him make him the swing tackle for a season essentially redshirt him and then say you've developed enough we're we're happy with your development we're going to make you the left tackle uh, to replace David Bakhtiari that's something i could see them doing but otherwise i think they'll throw you know three picks on a on day three players like they have in the past and and try and try and land another one of those those hidden gems that they've done Gutekunst is you know the last 3 years i mentioned earlier i think three guys on day three each of the last three years so mm-hmm. um, that's kind of how you churn out competition on your roster and and it makes sense to me um, because none of those guys that I mentioned earlier, like they're not, if they're not set in stone on the roster, then you can upgrade from them. And if you can upgrade from them, then you should. Yeah. Yeah. Their offensive line group right now is very interesting. They have a lot of versatile guys. They have a lot of bodies, like you said. And I feel decent about the majority of their preferred starters right now. You know, David Bakhtiari, he was, you know, still recovering from his ACL injury last year, but I have no doubt that he will produce this coming year, even if not at an all-pro level. Elton Jenkins is great. They just extended him. Josh Myers is maybe not what we had hoped for, but still a lot of time to go on that, and he's obviously always going to be compared to Creed Humphrey, who was taken just 
uh, one or two picks after him. Um, one. It was one. It was the very just next one. <laughs> yeah, that's a little unfortunate. Um, and then Zach Tom and Yash Diamond, two versatile young guys, but not a lot of depth there. And we've seen that lack of depth kind of hurt them over mm -hmm. these past two or three years, multiple times. Um, so that's unfortunate. And hopefully, my, you know, the offensive tackle group will be very interesting to see where those top three or four guys end up going. Um, and I can't see them trading up for one, like we've said uh, multiple times. Um, last question that we have been battling through uh, some technical difficulties, very bumpy episode, but let's end it off with one clear question. And I'll start off with Big B. Uh, Big B, who is your guy in this year's draft? Who is your draft crush? Man, I have completely ignored the draft like up to like last week. So like the one guy I really enjoyed watching was Nolan Smith from Georgia. I, lo I love how he plays. He would probably fit really well in Green Bay system. And he's been my guy for a couple months now. So I'm just going to roll with him. Okay. I'm going to say Darnell Washington from Georgia. Um, tied in big dog replacement, pretty much. Mercedes Lewis 2.0. Uh, love the the size on that man and love what he could do. It's trade down for him. Uh, so Jacob, I there I don't think there's any mission guys that are going to be in this first round here. So I'm going to assume that there won't be any bias in your answer here. Uh, maybe Mozzie Smith could sneak into the first round. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually the the nice part from a college fandom side of things is most of Michigan's best players came back. So mm. they've got a lot of their good guys coming back this year, but um as far as like my guy i'll give you a couple okay. uh miles miles murphy from clemson he's the pass rusher uh the the player comp from mike renner is rashawn gary um not okay quite like it. The, yeah not quite the same level athlete but you know the marshawn lynch run through your face thing mm -hmm. he's definitely got that as one of his abilities he's polished i think uh with some things that he's got so he's got some things he can already do as he comes into the nfl which is a big thing for some of the young guys so he knows a little bit of what he's doing. He's not just trying to run through offensive tackles. Cause if you do that, um, you know, they're NFL players. They're, they're pretty good. Yeah. Um, tight end Sam Laporta from Iowa is, is my guy. Well, I mean, this shouldn't be an original draft crush, but I guess I feel like it kind of is. And it's Michael <laughs> Mayer um, at that spot too. I think he's the best tight end in this class. Uh, mm. My, my guy Morley was talking today about how there's, there's some similarities. It's not quite the same. TJ Hawkinson tested as a bit better of an athlete, but I vividly remember Packer fans fawning over TJ Hawkinson for that class. And they kind of like, eh, whatever, when it comes to Michael Mayer, I think Mayer's the best tight end in this class. I think he can line up in line and play as their wide tight end uh, in line blocking for those of you guys that don't know what that means right away. And I think he's able to catch passes. Like he has the best tape which I think is pretty much agreed upon by that's a pretty consensus opinion. Mm -hmm. And he tested like a high level athlete is an 80th percentile athlete. So my question back to everybody was, so what are we doing? Like if he has the best tape and tested to the point where it's not like, you know, he's not a slow, like plotting receiver. then what are we doing? Why are we, why are we overthinking Michael Mayer essentially? And that's not to say I don't like Kincaid because I do. Um, but Laporta's the other guy if they can't get or don't get Mayer early. I think Laporta's uh, – he's my favorite guy after the big two, I call them. It's uh, Mayer and then Kincaid. I like Laporta quite a bit uh, after him and those guys. Uh, there's a few guys too. Like Keaton Mitchell is a, is a fun day three type of prospect at tight end. He, he runs like the wind. I think the Packers could use just an injection of speed playmaking type of stuff into their entire team, not just yes. – uh, not just their offense. I think that could be something, you know, it was nice last year to see like Keyshawn Nixon take over as the kickoff returner. And that is a playmaker. But the problem is number one, if you're receiving a kickoff, something bad happened. Number two, most teams until December can boom the ball out of the back of the end zone. So that's just not like, how many times are you going to be able to get the ball in his hands? Yeah. If, if he's just a kickoff. So I'll be interested to see if they do uh, live up to the whole, Think about potentially getting him some uh, some reps at at that like slot uh, receiver jet motion type of player that they have in the past. But those are a couple guys. Um, 
you ask for a Michigan guy, I'll give you one. Luke Schoonmaker. <laughs> That's a tight end. Uh, day like late day two, early day three type. He's like Michael Mayer light. Um, he's a little bit older of a prospect. I think he's, he caught Pat. I was watching a highlight tape of his the other day. He was catching passes from Shea Patterson. Like that was a really <laughs> long time ago. So he's been there for a really long time. Uh, had one of the COVID years he stuck around, but he's a wide tight end, but he is a capable receiver as well. So like, if you can't get mayor on day one, then maybe he's late day two, early day three type of players. So those are some of the guys, um, I did a lot of work on, on tight ends and pass rushers. So that's kind of where most of my stuff came from. Um, if you want one other guy who I just, the Packers aren't going to draft him, but I kind of wish they would. It's Jack Campbell, the linebacker from Iowa. I just throwback type player, but like, I don't like throwing out the comparison to like Luke Keekley, but just mm -hmm. the instincts from an intangible and instincts and everything that doesn't show up like on the spreadsheets type of stuff. I think Campbell fits all of that stuff. Um, any like Iowa, when you see them play against Ohio state, like you expect the Buckeyes to just kind of be able to run by them and run circles around them. Cause yeah. they are, they're, they're the, one of the most athletic teams in the entire country, but Campbell kind of holds his own. Now, is he as good of an athlete as his testing scores? Maybe not, but I do think he's a really good athlete. So I got a few guys, some of them, the Packers, I think everybody else I mentioned, the Packers have a chance of drafting, uh, this particular one. I, I don't think they have a chance of drafting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Thank you for that. And hopefully one of those guys is drafted by the Packers so that I can pull that clip and use it on Instagram. But nothing will ever compare to our second episode that we ever did. And shoot, I'm just realizing now that we might have missed the three year anniversary of underage Packers, which be would be bad. But we did. Oh, man. Can you call right. it that anymore? Like, are you guys able to call we, it on? You're of age now. Yeah, we are discussing uh, the the future plans uh, of this, but yeah, it, it is a beautiful mystery of what that looks like as. Of oh Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> Bravo! Story, but thank you. But anyways, in the second episode that we ever did, we have our great friend uh, Norman Gratz on, and he perfectly predicted the Jordan Love pick. He perfectly predicted that he would. Um, fall a little bit later into mm -hmm. uh, where he was projected and that the Packers would trade up for him. He said he didn't say he wanted it to happen, but he predicted that it would happen and or that it could happen. And he also predicted the, the ensuing meltdown that happened on Packers Twitter. So I don't think we'll ever get uh, that close to no. uh, foreseeing something like that, though. But Jacob, uh, thank you. Can for I give you a prediction here. then? Give it a shot. Yes, at let's, let's hear your best guess here. Yeah, I think Green Bay trades out of pick number 15 down and mm -hmm. that their first round pick is in the 20s somewhere. I don't I don't want to give you an exact number. It won't be whatever pick Minnesota has. Yes, yeah. But I think they trade into the 20s and their first round pick is Michael Mayer, the tight end from Notre Dame. Okay, I like it. I like that a lot. I'm just hoping I'll be there in person for night one. So I just hope they don't make a crazy move 17 picks down out of the first round. Because watching it on TV in 2017 to trade down um, out of the first round to take Kevin Keene the next day, uh, that was depressing enough to watch it on TV. So I don't want to travel all the way out to Kansas City just to see Brian Gutekind take the night off. But I, I don't probably. think that's going to happen. So yeah, think, yeah. You know, from 15 to 32, which is the first pick of the second round this year, that's a really long. Yes, drop. that that would be quite a bit of compensation that would have to be added in there. Yes, but we'll see. So, other than that, though, Jacob, where can uh, people find your uh, draft takes outside of this? Yeah. So, if you guys are, I don't. Um, it's close enough to draft day to where you guys really want to get into this. The green Bay draft guide is where you can get my draft takes uh, specifically. It's nine 99. Uh, it's a pretty quick little investment for 225 profiles, three features, one from myself, one from Jacob Morley and one from Ross Uglum over at Packer report, which is who it's sponsored by. I write for them at Packer report 66 Wednesday nights until the draft is over. You guys can catch me on the gold zone with Jacob Morley, which is over at game on Wisconsin. And then all things, Twitter, um that's pretty much where a vast majority of my takes go now is at jacob westendorf uh, which is just my name perfect i'll make sure to link below the draft guide in the description to this video and other than that jacob uh, i look forward uh, to seeing your draft takes over this uh, long weekend we got coming up here
resolution. A lot of technical difficulties in there. A lot of uh, mishaps, a lot of mispronunciations. It's all right, though. We made it through. And hopefully, once I edit this, it will come through as a good discussion with Jacob. Um, we will be here during this lovely draft week. Big B has got at least one more mock draft coming out on the way here. I'm sure I'll have at least one more video going on. And then, like I said, I'll be in Kansas City for night one, and I'm going to try to film at least a little bit of content there. And then for those three days of the draft, who knows what we'll be doing? We have no clue. But you want to subscribe so you'll know. Even if it's nothing, you'll want to know, yes. I'm telling you. So yeah. we appreciate you tuning in to this episode of Underage Packers. Uh, Big B, anything you want to throw in there on probably our probably our final episode before the draft? Um, Packers are going to draft good football players. You've heard it here first. Wow. Okay. That's even in the third round. Yes. We're, we're changing things up this year. Whoa. Okay. I know. That's, that's a big prediction there, sir. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, make sure you subscribe to our, us on all of our socials and then also Jacob on Twitter. And we'll talk to you later. As always. Go Pack Go.